We'll get back to Let's Make a Deal in a moment, but first, U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch is expected to launch a civil rights investigation into the Baltimore Police Department. We're watching a live look right now from the Department of Justice in Washington. We're waiting for Lynch to take the podium. We're expecting her in just a few minutes. As you know, she visited Baltimore earlier this month on Tuesday. She met with the mayor, religious leaders, local city leaders, law enforcement, as well as elected officials. And she said she left the meetings with the sense that the city is working saying that they're working on their problems but may need to do more. The mayor did also ask the Justice Department to open the civil rights investigation to probe whether police discriminate and use excessive force on a broad scale. Now, Lynch said, quote, although the city has made significant strides in their collaborative reform efforts with the community-oriented policing services office, I have not ruled out the possibility that more may need to be done. We are listening to all voices. She also added, quote, we're currently in the process of considering the request from city officials and community leaders for an investigation into whether the Baltimore Police Department engaged in a pattern or practice of civil rights violations. She said, I intend to have a decision in the coming days. Again, she met with the mayor on Tuesday and other city leaders, so it's Friday is quite fast. She told lawmakers that she is considering a review of the Baltimore Police Department after the death of 25-year-old Freddie Gray, who died while he was in police custody. The mayor said she did ask on Wednesday, the day after meeting the U.S. Attorney General, for her to open this DOJ investigation. After Gray's death from a severe spinal injury in police custody, it prompted violent protests and riots. And let's listen to Loretta Lynch now. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. I am joined today by Vanita Gupta, the head of the department's Civil Rights Division, and Director Ron Davis of the Community Oriented Policing Service Office's Office, or COPS. Now, as we all know, as we've all seen, over the past few days and weeks, we have watched as Baltimore has struggled with issues that face cities across our country today. We have seen the tragic loss of a young man's life. We have seen a peaceful protest movement coalesce to express the concern of a beleaguered community. We have seen brave officers upholding the right to peaceful protest while also sustaining serious injuries themselves during the city's unfortunate foray into violence. And we have watched it all through the prism of one of the most challenging issues of our time, the issue of police community relations. When I traveled to Baltimore earlier this week, I had an opportunity to see the significant work that the city and the police department had done with the COPS office over the last six months through a collaborative reform process. But despite the progress being made, it was clear that recent events, including the tragic in-custody death of Mr. Freddie Gray, had given rise to a serious erosion of public trust. In order to address this issue, I have been asked by city officials and community leaders to augment our approach to the situation with a court enforcement model. I've spent the last few days with my team considering which of the Justice Department's tools for police reform best meets the current needs of the Baltimore Police Department and the broader Baltimore community. Today, the Department of Justice is opening an investigation into whether the Baltimore Police Department has engaged in a pattern or practice of violations of the Constitution or federal law. This investigation will begin immediately and will focus on allegations that Baltimore Police Department officers use excessive force, including deadly force, conduct unlawful searches, seizures, and arrests, and engage in discriminatory policing. The COPS Office will continue to work with the Baltimore Police Department, and the collaborative reform process will now convert to the provision of technical assistance to the Baltimore Police Department. Now, some may ask how this differs from our current work with Baltimore Police Department. And the answer is, rather than examining whether the police department violated good policies, we will now examine whether they violated the Constitution and the community's civil rights. This approach has been welcomed by the Baltimore City Fraternal Order of Police, and I want to thank them for their support and their partnership as we move forward. Now, in the coming days, Civil Rights Division attorneys and investigators conducting the investigation and the police experts who will assist them will be engaging with community members and with law enforcement. We will examine policies, practices, and available data. 
and at the conclusion of our investigation, we will issue a report of our findings. If unconstitutional policies or practices are found, we will seek a court-enforceable agreement to address those issues. We will also continue to move forward to improve policing in Baltimore, even as the pattern or practice investigation is underway. Our goal is to work with the community, public officials, and law enforcement alike to create a stronger, better Baltimore. The Department of Justice Civil Rights Division has conducted dozens of these pattern or practice investigations to date, and we have seen from our work in jurisdictions across the country that communities that have gone through this process are experiencing improved policing practices and increased trust between the police and the community. In fact, I encourage other cities to study our past recommendations and see whether they can be applied in their own communities. Ultimately, this process is meant to ensure that officers are being provided with the tools that they need, including training, policy guidance, and equipment to be more effective, to partner with civilians, and to strengthen public safety. Now, for many people across the country, the tragic death of Mr. Freddie Gray and the unfortunate violence that did occur has come to personify the city as if that alone is Baltimore. But earlier this week, I visited with members of the community who took to the streets in the days following the unrest to pick up trash, to clear away debris, and they are Baltimore. I visited with elected officials who were determined to help the neighborhoods that they love come back stronger and more united, and they are Baltimore. I visited youth leaders who believe that there is a brighter day ahead, and they are Baltimore too. And I also visited with law enforcement officers who had worked up to 16 days without a break. And they were focused not on themselves or even their own safety, but on protecting the people who live in their community. They too are Baltimore. Now, none of us have any illusions that reform is easy. The challenges that we face and that Baltimore faces now did not arise in a day and change will not come overnight. It will take time and sustained effort. But the people that I met in Baltimore, from the protesters to the public officials to the officers, including one who had been injured amidst the violence, all were saying to me ultimately the same thing. I love my city and I want to make it better. And that is why I'm optimistic about this process. And that's why I am actually hopeful about the days and weeks to come. And that is why I am confident that as a result of this investigation and the hard work that is still ahead, and make no mistake about it, it is hard work, all members of the Baltimore community, residents and law enforcement alike, will be able to create a stronger, a safer, and a more united city together. Thank you for your time and your attention. And this time I'd like to open it up for a few questions. <coughs> Uh, part of the, uh, the request itself that came from, from the city, <clears throat> what have you seen or heard from residents of Baltimore that would lead you to believe that the ongoing Justice Department review would in fact need to be augmented? Is the progress not sufficient? Are the problems deeper than perhaps you had initially understood? Um, can you talk a little bit about why the Justice Department believes that the COPS review itself doesn't work or is not sufficient for this? Certainly. And let me say at the outset that we believe very strongly in the collaborative reform process, and it has helped numerous communities and police departments across the country. But for collaborative reform to ultimately be effective, we really need to have that three-part uh, base of support police engagement, elected official engagement, and community engagement, and the ability to have faith in the process. Obviously, we've all seen events change in Baltimore and become much more intense over a very, very short period of time. And it was clear to a number of people looking at this situation that the community's rather frayed trust, to use an understatement, um, was even worse and has, in, fa in effect, been severed in terms of the relationship with the police department. So we felt that that was one factor in viewing whether or not we would literally be able to use collaborative reform to actually make the changes that we need. Also, as we look more at the issues facing the police department itself in terms of the needs that they have and in terms of the issues the residents were raising, they, they essentially were much more serious and they were more intense than when we began the collaborative review process. And so we felt that the best thing to do was to conduct an investigation to see whether or not these issues arose to the level of federal civil rights violations, and if so, have the best model in which to address them, which in our view is a court-enforceable agreement. 
Mikulski yesterday made reference to a fractured trust between police and communities around the country, not only in Baltimore. And I wonder, from your standpoint, how serious that fracture is nationally. Well, you know, we've had a number of situations that have highlighted this fracture in various communities, um, in different parts of the country, cities of all sizes, uh, ranging issues ranging from from people being uh, being harmed or unfortunate deaths in custody. So I think we see it when it occurs. But I think that the issue really goes beyond just the interaction between the police and the community, because we're talking about generations not only of mistrust but generations of communities that feel very separate from government overall. And so you're talking about situations where there's a flashpoint um, occurrence that coalesces years of frustration and anger. Uh, and that's what I think you saw in Baltimore when there was that unfortunate night of violence. And I think you see it in other, country, in other cities around the country as well. You can't look at a city and predict what's going to happen. You can't look at a city um, and, and analyze it, and certainly we're not looking to do that. What we hope, though, is that our work, both through collaborative reform and past investigations, other cities can look at their own environments and decide what issues they, that they see and whether or not some of the work that's been done in the past can be brought to bear and help them as well. I'd actually point to the gentleman right behind you. Will the department release any of the findings that the folks have found in a collaborative review, or will that information be folded into the pattern of practice? The information is going to be folded into the pattern of practice investigation. Typically, however, when we do a collaborative reform uh, effort with the police department, that usually does report do, does um, end in a report that is made public. Because we're now going to fold it into an investigation, we actually will not be having that collaborative reform report. There will be, however, a report at the end of the pattern of practice investigation that will draw on that. Um, this violence took place just as you were coming into office. As you saw it unfold, what was your reaction? What did you think? Well, I have to say, um, you know, I watched it as did most people um, through the prism of my television screen. And, um, but have seen similar incidents across the country. And I would have to say that my first reaction was profound sadness. It, it, it truly was. It was profound sadness for the loss of life, for the erosion of trust, for the, 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 the sadness and despair that the community was feeling, um, for um, the frustration that I know the police officers were feeling also as they tried to, in, to encourage peaceful protests but then had to deal with violence. And so I'd say my first reaction was profound sadness. The uh, FBI director and the Secretary of Homeland Security are having a teleconference today with the nation's police to talk about this growing concern over ISIS social media. How much of a concern is that? How urgent a concern is that for the Justice Department? You know, as we look into um, our national security cases, we have um, attempted to you to see which tools those who would seek to do Americans harm utilize. And so I think social media is certainly one that we've seen be used uh, in the cases that, uh, that result in my old district. We've seen social media be used as a recruitment tool, as a means of disseminating information. So it is certainly an area that we try and keep, stay on top of. Um, but I would say it's part of the full panoply of things that we look at as we try and determine um, who's essentially trying to do us harm. Yes. Um, I apologize for not knowing everyone's name right away. Otherwise, I would not simply be pointing to you in this manner. <laughs> but yes. Paula Reed, CBS News. Oh. So for the Garland Police Department, they said that they didn't have sufficient information that a threat was headed their way. With the proliferation of these ISIS-inspired individuals here in the United States, how are you guys working to make sure that local officials are looped into the threats you guys are identifying at the federal level? Well, what I can tell you is that when information is determined um, to generate a threat to any police department, we do provide them with as much information as we can. I think in this situation you saw there was an individual who had come under scrutiny before but had not been very active in the immediate You were just past. listening to U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch speaking from Washington, D.C. She just announced the Department of Justice is opening an investigation into the Baltimore City Police Department starting immediately, looking into allegations of excessive force and unlawful arrest. We will have much more on Lynch's announcement today on WJZ Eyewitness News at noon. Now back to Let's Make a Deal.